Hi, everyone, and welcome to our grand finale show of uh, Table Manners for Robots. That is for this year, definitely not the grand finale in general. Um, we've had a fantastic series working with and talking to small businesses, uh, small business leaders, people associated with small businesses. We kicked off a series called Unite the Small earlier this year. And I want to reflect on that for just a second. At the time of us kicking off the series, we were going through quite a difficult time in the country. We had so much uncertainty. We really didn't know where things were going to go. And I think that just from an emotional point of view, how I was feeling at the time of kicking off the series was quite different to how I feel today as, a, as someone who um, runs a small business myself. And um, I have to say that it's, it's, it's wonderful to have seen what's happened in the country, to see how spirits have lifted and how things have continued to be uh, positive despite all the difficulties we've gone through. And for me, it's been a real testimony of the, uh, you know, the, the, the South African spirit. I've got to see it in, in action. And, and we've come a long way from the time we kicked up the series to where we are today. And I'm very happy to have, um, as part of this grand finale episode, our last show for the year, we have with us um, a very esteemed leader, um, Dumasani, who is from SAP. Um, I'm going to you know, give him the opportunity to talk a little bit more about himself and his background. So I'm not going to uh, try to do it justice in any way, but I'm very excited about the show and the energy of the show is very, very different in that we're closing off for the year. We're getting set up for a very exciting uh, break ahead of us. And let's see what we have in store for 2021. So on that note, let's welcome uh, Dumi. Dumi, welcome to Table Manners for Robots. Uh, super excited to have you on. So let's start off with, just tell us a little bit about your background. Firstly, uh, thank you for having me and uh, good day to your viewers. I'm absolutely uh, honored and excited to be part of your final show for the year. Um, my background is, um, you know, I've been in the technology space for almost 20 years now. Um, and as you say, you know, I head up uh, SAP's uh, mid-market business. Uh, responsible for the private sector and the public sector uh, within the mid-market space. Uh, so we work with uh, small businesses or small and medium-sized uh, businesses uh, in all sorts of industries and verticals. Uh, and it's an absolutely exciting space because uh, I think the future of our country and certainly the future of the global economy, uh, you know, is uh, what the small businesses can uh, uh, can bring about in, in the form of innovation, uh, etc. So yeah, but my background, uh, to get back to your question, you know, I, uh, I, I've worked for quite a number of uh, uh, companies in the technology space, notably I spent a lot of time at Dell, um, uh, focused in the infrastructure business. Um, and uh, at Dell as well, you know, got the opportunity to work with uh, 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 with SME uh, companies as well. So it's been, uh, my, my entire career has really been centered around, you know, uh, working in this space. Awesome, awesome. So Dumi, just so that it's clear to everyone on the show, um, you are, I think you're being very modest in your description here. You are the leader of the mid-market business for SAP here in Africa. That's correct, right? That, that's correct, yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. That's quite a portfolio. So awesome. Um, now, um, Dumi, I know that you are, as much as you're a man of business, you are also a man of academics. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about this? <laughs> okay. Um, so I mean, the, I mean, I, 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 probably the right way of saying it is an aspiring academic. Um, I think you never get to the stage where you become truly one. Um, so I've had a very interesting uh, journey uh, with academics, at least I think it's interesting. Um, you know, after, after completing my metric uh, many moons ago, I, um, I couldn't go to university like most uh, South Africans have that type of challenge. But I made uh, a promise to myself that, you know, when the time is right, uh, I'm going to get uh, to go to university and get to experience what that looks and feels like. Uh, but I think deep seated within me, uh, um, my passion for academic re uh, academics really resonates uh, from a place where uh, education can make uh, a fundamental difference in society, you know, developing and empowering yourself uh, to be an active participant in the economy is something that I absolutely uh, have always been passionate about. 
um, as well as you know the difference that one can make in society. So my passion uh, really was centered around the difference that I can make through academics, hopefully one day uh, when I slow down from the corporate world and, and go focus um, on academics. Uh, so the journey started in my 30s. When I turned 30, I decided you know, I was going to I was going to get started on my undergrad uh, degree. Uh, so I started, um, you know, a degree in business management, and my focus was uh, in marketing management. You know, got that done in about five years. You know, it's kind of difficult balancing, you know, a full time job, a young family, and all the other pressures of life. So once I was done with. Uh, with my undergrad, I decided I wanted to pursue uh, an honors. Uh, so I did an honors in business management, also focusing on marketing management. Uh, got that done. And then, you know, the, um, at that point, I think I'd become addicted. Um, so I decided to pursue uh, a master's. Uh, I did a master's of philosophy in business management. And uh, at that time, I decided to change to responsible leadership. Um, I'm going to talk to you about why, uh, why responsible leadership, uh, but I got that done and uh, I decided, you know, I'm going to do one more, uh, one more, and then I got started with my PhD, uh, which is what I'm currently busy with, uh, a very challenging journey. Uh, sometimes I wonder why I got started, um, but my PhD is focusing on business management and my area of uh, interest is responsible leadership. Um, in particular, you know, the, the role that companies can play in society. Uh, so without getting too technical, uh, my study uh, uh, focuses or intends to focus on, you know, corporate social responsibility, in particular, the role of companies uh, in society. Uh, it's the old age debate between, you know, are companies or businesses in the business of, you know, generating profits for the owner for the shareholders uh, versus, you know, the notion of corporate social responsibility, which speaks to the obligation that companies have to society. Mm, mm. Uh, so it's a very, you know, it's a very interesting, I guess academics is not the most interesting thing around, but to me, it is absolutely a very uh, challenging and interesting area because, you know, the makeup of business as we know it today has been around for as long as businesses have been around. Uh, so that's the one aspect of my study. The other aspect is corporate social responsibility, which has been around arguably uh, from the 1800s uh, when companies started recognizing that they had a role to play in society. So it's two very mature theories uh, that have been studied to death. Uh, so it's very difficult to find a gap uh, that one can pursue, uh, but I'm determined to, because I think you know beyond uh, the academic value, uh, I think there's an absolute uh, need uh, for, for us to reorientate the conversation towards, you know, the role of business in society beyond profits. Mm, mm. Um, in a nutshell, that's kind of what, um, I, 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 what my academic interests uh, and pursuits uh, look like. Mm, mm. Very interesting. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things in there that I want to unpack a little bit more that I find very interesting. Um, yeah. So uh, the first thing I want to remark on is that, you know, while a lot of us, you know, got into our 30s and we use that as a bit of a time to focus squarely on the career and to be very, very job oriented, um, you know, here you were not just balancing your, the demands of your work, you were also um, working pretty much your entire 30s by the way you describe it, um, you know, head down, uh, focus on business and academia. So man, that requires time management of note, I would imagine. Yeah, I think there's very interesting synergies between, you know, business, uh, we, uh, which is the practical aspect of it, and academics, which is the theory part of it. If you think about what happens in business, a lot of what is, uh, has become, you know, approaches to doing things. If you think about a SWOT analysis, for example, you know, before it was a predominant, you know, approach in business, it was it was a piece of theory, you know, it was a piece of theory that uh, academics and scholars contended with, um, and, and I guess it found its way into uh, the business world, and it's become a useful tool for understanding competitive advantage, uh, as an example. So I think there are very, you know, well-defined and very clear synergies between the two, 
I think the challenge is uh, time management, as you put it. Um, time for me is a very interesting concept. Um, I always say that if we had uh, uh, 36 hours in a day, 36 hours wouldn't be enough. Mm-hmm. You know, we always complain that 24 hours is not enough, but even if you had 36 hours, it still wouldn't be enough. So I think it's a case of prioritizing. Of course, it's difficult to keep all these balls in the air. Uh, but for me personally, academics is a bit of an escape. Uh, so if I need to get away from the pressures of being an adult and being a parent and being uh, a professional, someone that has to uh, meet certain obligations, uh, academics is absolutely my escape from the real world. But there is intrinsic value uh, in that, you know, things that happen in theory absolutely can be tested uh, in practice. Mm, interesting, interesting. I like the way you say that academics can be a bit of an escape from the perhaps some of the harshnesses of the real world. Very interesting take on it and definitely a very productive way to find a, uh, an outlet. I'm, I know of many other um, less um, honorable uh, escape methods. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, I think you've chosen wisely there, my friend. Um, so yeah. excellent, uh, Dumi. Um, you know, I really do admire the commitment, and I and I particularly admire the fact that you know you could have just done your your degree and your honors, and maybe just taken a break. You know, but you've just gone one after the next, and you've just kept going throughout. You know, it just blows my mind that that level of dedication and that little level of commitment. I think it's really. Mm, something that, uh, that a lot of us uh, will admire from the outside. Because for me, I did my stuff early on in my 20s, the usual sort of high school, then uh, university, and then I went into business. And, and, and to just marry business back into the world of academia, I've always struggled with. So maybe after this, uh, after this show, you can give me some pointers, you can give me some tips yeah. in the tutorial, as long as you don't invoice me, you know, that's going to be, uh, <laughs> that's going to be useful. So, um, you know, um, uh, Dumi, before I carry on with my next question here, I just want to quickly, um, you know, make a comment here to our guests. We've have we have quite a few guests online. That's great, guys. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for becoming part of this grand finale episode. So um, a reminder to everyone, if you weren't here at the opening, that uh, this is the last of our series called Unite for Small for the year 2020. This is our last Table Manners for Robots show for the year. We will kick off again early next year uh, <clears throat> with details to follow. Just uh, keep uh, connected to our social pages, keep connected to our YouTube uh, channel, and we will post details as much as possible so you know when our first episode will air in the new year. But for now, let's just make let's just make a celebration of this. We've come through an incredibly difficult year. Man, we've just worked so hard to keep our head um, our heads above water. It's been taxing for all of us. Let's just let's just enjoy the show. Let's just participate, put forward your questions, be funny, be relaxed, say whatever you want to about what this year has been like for you. If you want to share some of your personal experience, go ahead, put it into the chat box or put it into the Q&A box. I prefer the Q&A box. Just go ahead and throw that into Zoom. If you're listening on Facebook or on YouTube uh, or Periscope, please go ahead and put your comments in there. We'll pick it up and we'll um, I'll, I'll read it out on the show. So let's have some fun. Let's make this a really cool conversation. I'm very excited about our guest. We have um, some Someone that I deeply respect from SAP, the head of uh, the mid-market business uh, at SAP Africa, Dumasani Moyo. He's joining us today. So really, let's make the best use of Dumi's time and send those questions and comments through. All right. So um, Dumi, you mentioned quite a few areas of focus and specialization. There's, your, there's kind of your professional specialization. You, you're dealing with a lot of small business, small to medium business. You also have this uh, corporate social responsibility aspect coming through in your in your academic work. And there's also the element of uh, leadership that you mentioned. Um, so uh, tell us, like, uh, what made you specialize in this particular area or areas? Yeah, I think I touched on it a, a little bit earlier. Um, you know, if you just think of uh, the role that small businesses play, uh, both in the global economy and locally in South Africa, and I guess in an African context. You know, here at home, you know, uh, small businesses are a key contributor to uh, GDP. I mean, there's a number of estimates, but uh, the ones that that I think uh, are relatively accurate is that it's not of 30%. Um, We also know that, uh, you know, the SME sector is a significant employer 
Um, there's all sorts of estimates, you know, north of 40 to 50 percent. Mm. Uh, globally, you know, um, according to the World Bank, uh, the SME sector contributes, you know, north of 50 percent of the global GDP uh, and really is a significant employer. The estimates are also north of uh, 50 percent as well. So I think, you know, SMEs uh, a key uh, and a very important part of, uh, of society. Um, and as I said earlier on, you know, my passion around uh, this sector is, you know, uh, we absolutely appreciate that the sector plays a fundamental role in society, but it, I think it's also important to make sure that uh, this sector is, uh, is empowered, uh, you know, to be at the forefront of innovation um, that it's empowered as well to create businesses that are sustainable in the long term and businesses that are able to, you know, uh, to be resilient uh, to, you know, uh, external shocks. I mean, COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic is a very prime example of an external shock that was completely, you know, a surprise to all of us. We knew it was coming, but we didn't know how devastating it was going to be. Uh, so I think um the, the the whole notion of you know making these businesses uh play an even more significant role in society and ensuring that they are sustainable in the long term is an absolute uh, passion of mine and luckily you know i get to do this as my everyday job as well uh because in my in my role uh, what's important to me are the business conversations around how technology can be an enabler for progress um, so, um, it's, I think at that, at that, at that level, uh, KG, it's, it's been quite a fascinating thing for me to try and balance, you know, that, um, uh, that aspect of corporate social responsibility in my pursuits, in my personal space, uh, with really, you know, uh, empowering small businesses to be even more significant, uh, in society. Awesome. Very, very um, interesting um, insights there into why you why you wound up here. I've got some nice comments coming through. I'm going to start reading them out. So again, uh, attendees, it's great to get this participation. It's it's great to hear your voice in the show. So please keep these thoughts coming through. So the first one here, Dumi, I um, think you're going to like this one. It says, um, Kulile says, I see you saved the best for last KG. Always super excited to hear Dumi's insights on SMEs and business in general. So uh, you have yourself a fan here already, uh, <laughs> Dumi, uh, stealing yeah. the limelight, which is good. Um, next, uh, we have a question here from uh, Sashin Singh. Um, before I, I read out the, the question, I just want to read out what this acronym means. So uh, Sashin's put forward an acronym of ESG, which is Environment, Social and Governance. Um, and his question yeah. is, Hi, Kirushan and uh, Jamsani. I would like to know, do you see sustainability and ESG becoming a full-time job just like a financial operations function needed in any company? How does one get into such a sector and create the demand for these roles? Do you want to comment on that, uh, yeah. Jimmy? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting space and thank you for that question. Um, I think there is definitely, you know, a role for uh, ESG. I think uh, it's perhaps to set some context to what I'm going to say, you know, corporate social re responsibility has seen a multitude of uh, different uh, definitions uh, throughout its evolution. And I think some of the key influences on, so on, uh, on CSR has been, you know, things like... Uh, uh, economy obviously is a factor, uh, you know, uh, things like the environment. Uh, uh, often when we talk about global warming, it sounds like this abstract concept that would never affect us. But some of the extreme weather conditions and droughts that we're experiencing are as uh, an impact of uh, global warming, for example. So global warming has had, I guess, or the environmental aspect has had an impact on CSR as well as the uh, the social aspects of society, you know, what we call societal challenges. You know, societal challenges take a, a number of forms. You know, in the South African context, you could talk to inequality, poverty, access to healthcare, education, all of these things, uh, situations that are happening in society. So I think, you know, companies don't exist in a vacuum, uh, right? Companies exist in society. And by the way, 
you know, customers that companies sell to our members of society. Uh, so I think it's in the best interest of companies in the long term to make sure that society is in the healthiest possible state. Because uh, your customers come from society, your employees come from society, your different stakeholders, shareholders, you know, suppliers come from society. But more importantly, uh, KG, you know, businesses are not set up in a vacuum. You set up a business in society. When you, when you set up a business, you're using uh, societal infrastructure, using roads, you know, electricity, you're using the transport system. All of these things are designed and are paid for by taxpayers, which are members of society. So I think it, it, it comes full circle when you really think about, you know, the obligations and the role of companies in society. Uh, the key obligation is to make sure you've got a healthy society in all aspects. Uh, so I think, you know, companies do have a need uh, for practitioners that play in that space. And it's becoming mainstream, especially in bigger companies. Some companies still use consultants, uh, but I think by and large, you know, it's not uncommon to find someone that is in, in charge of sustainability. Of course, companies define this differently. Some custom, uh, companies focus on, on the ESG uh, uh, aspect. Some customers focus on uh, stakeholder relations or stakeholder management. Some companies focus on the classic uh, CSR, uh, CSR approach. Uh, but the role is definitely there. The way of getting into it, I think, is first and foremost, just appreciating and understanding the significant role of companies in society. Uh, of course, you'd need to study something. Uh, you know, there's a number of institutions that offer, you know, courses that are somewhat tailored to that. I personally, you know, I don't want to advertise for anyone, but I'm a, I'm a student of University of Pretoria. You know, they, uh, they have a school of leadership that focuses on responsible leadership, and that's why I decided to go with them. Uh, I think you could do a bit of research there. You'll find a few sort of institutions that focus in that area. Then you can decide if you want to go the consultant route or if you want to, you know, be gainfully employed focusing on sustainability. Mm, very comprehensive answer. And it's totally acceptable for you to do um, some referrals and recommendations to <laughs> tax and otherwise. Yeah. That's totally, totally fine because it's not like a public radio station or anything like that. Um, yeah. Good. So, so I like that. Uh, thanks, Sashin, for the question. Again, guys, if you're um, watching in, uh, if you watching the show online, whether you're doing it on Facebook, Periscope, uh, YouTube, etc., or whether you're watching on Zoom, um, just share your uh, thoughts, comments. I will make sure that we get we get around to everyone. So make your voice heard. Let's make the best use of uh, Dumi's precious time here with us. Um, so Dumi, tell us uh, on that. Uh, you you gave a lot of great advice, uh, specifically in the context of ESG. What what are your thoughts on the overall context of South Africa right now? Okay, it's a very interesting question. Uh, and I guess there's multiple perspectives to look at this question. If you spoke to someone that is in the finance space, they'll probably give you a different answer to what I'm going to give you. Uh, but my view is that, you know, uh, just to get some context and perspective for ourselves, you know, South Africa has always been in the forefront of innovation. Uh, if you think of the CAT scan or the CAT scan machine, if you went to the doctor and you needed to look into your brain and see what's going on and they do a CAT scan of some sort, you know, that, uh, that is a South African innovation, right? If you think of the first heart, heart transplant, that's a South African innovation. You think of, um, you know, producing oil from coal, that's a South African innovation. In fact, uh, Sasol is the biggest producer of oil from coal globally. You, um, I mean, there have a number of operations, including the US. Uh, and what's interesting with that is uh, that that started off as a need to address a, a, a problem and a problem in society because we don't have oil in South Africa and we have to find ways of uh, producing oil. Um, and I mean, the list goes on. If you think of the creepy crawly, you know, to clean your pool, that's a South African innovation. You think of Q20, you know, to stop a door from squeaking, that's a, another innovation. So there's a number of areas where South Africans have really been in the forefront of resolving problems through innovation. In recent times, you could think of someone like an Elon Musk, we all like to claim him, <laughs> uh, you know, but Elon Musk uh, uh, is obviously a, someone that came out of South Africa. Uh, of course, you know, he moved on to Canada and eventually the US. I actually had the privilege of meeting him uh, in my previous life, when I was still with uh, uh, Dell Technologies, oh. one of the events, he was there as a keynote speaker, very fascinating guy. But what is uh, uh, sort of um, 
very uh, obvious about South Africans is that, you know, we operate in an environment that's got challenges and by nature, we've come uh, accustomed to resolving problems. I mean, you could talk about, you know, other than Elon Musk and his uh, amazing innovations at SpaceX and Tesla uh, and PayPal, by the way, uh, you could uh, talk about, you know, the first behavioral bank in the world, which is Discovery, right? No one had thought of, uh, you know, a behavioral bank. Uh, no one had thought of, you know, creating a lifestyle product like Vitality and turning that into a business. You know, you could, uh, maybe just one more example, you could talk about, you know, we've got a, a bank in South Africa that is one of the biggest, you know, uh, providers of, uh, of uh, connectivity through cell phones, right? Uh, they're in the business of uh, money, but uh, they had called data in that they had your details, they know how much you earn, they know where you spend your money, and they decided to turn that call data into insight and started uh, providing uh, cell phones. Um, so new revenue streams through innovation. Uh, so South Africa is, you know, has got a, a ton of uh, opportunity, of course, there's a lot of issues that we could talk about, but I think out of any adversity and out of any challenge, there's always opportunity. Uh, so you've got to look at the opportunity and you've got to look at how you best address that opportunity in the most efficient manner and uh, in a way that delivers value for you as an entrepreneur, but also for the community that you operate within. Uh, so I think the opportunity is, is massive. We just need to figure out how we become you know, sustainable in how we develop businesses and how we become innovative and uh, as efficient as we possibly can. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, probably if I had to, you know, I don't necessarily want to show a, a bias in particular, but perhaps for, the, for our entire Unite for Small series, I would say that that would rank amongst one of my favorite answers to any question for the entire series. And I love the fact that there was all this positive, uh, you know, validation of what we bring as South Africans. And I think we sometimes neglect this and we neglect this positive aspect to identity. There's a lot of negatives, which we tend to focus on quite a lot. And I love the fact that we talked about it. I mean, even something that occurred to me while you were speaking, even UNISA being uh, the world's largest uh, distance learning um, university and, and, and obviously distance learning becoming more of a thing nowadays than it was in the past. We are at the forefront of that because our systems and processes were in place to service, um, you know, many, many, many uh, millions of uh, students. And now the world is almost catching up. So I think there's, there's many positives that we can rely on to carry us through difficulties like what we're seeing in the, in the current world transition. Really beautiful. So let's 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 keep talking a little bit about Mzanzi magic. I love Mzanzi magic. I'm a firm believer of Mzanzi magic. Um, folks, uh, for those of you who are listening, I really want you to be part of this excitement. I really want you to be part of this positive uh, message as we as we uh, go through our grand finale of our um, Unite for Small series, a uh, last show, um, uh, last Table Manners for Robots show for the year please be part of it, like share your wins, share your thoughts. If you have an exciting story which communicates and conveys that beautiful fighting spirit of South Africa, if you, if you have that, if, you, if you're feeling it, please go ahead and share it. I think it's just a wonderful platform, wonderful opportunity for all of us. We're already in December. It's the 2nd of December. We're starting to close out the year before we go out on holiday, before we go off wherever we're going to go. Let's just be, let's end off on a high. So let's just keep thinking these positive thoughts and sharing them. I love it. So on the subject of um, Mzanzi Magic here, uh, you know, what are some of the examples, the actual examples of resilience uh, you've seen in more recent times, um, Dumi? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, what's pretty uh, interesting, I think, is that we all know people that are entrepreneurs in our personal lives. Uh, and I do know quite a number of our family members and friends. Um, and granted, you know, some of them are subsistence entrepreneurs. You know, you get into entrepreneurship as a way of uh, sustaining a living. Uh, but I think out of that, you know, you end up with the bigger purpose. Uh, and obviously, once you see the opportunity, you can expand into other things. But what's been very interesting is I had a conversation with um, uh, with a friend um, that is in the entrepreneurial space, and was talking to me about how COVID came about, and uh, you know, a thriving business that he had uh, uh, literally came to a standing uh, uh, halt 
you know, overnight. And the biggest challenge he had was that, you know, his business was uh, predicated on uh, having customer face-to-face -face interaction. And that's how he sold, uh, uh, sold his products and uh, took his value to the market. Um, and uh, as COVID, you know, two, three months into COVID, we're talking about, so how do you create more routes to market and how do you make sure that you've got multiple ways of taking your value um, uh, to customers? And one of the ways you obviously had thought about was starting a website and creating an online store. And uh, once that was up and running, you started thinking about, so how do I make this as efficient as I possibly can? You know, instead of running his own, uh, you know, online store himself, uh, he used uh, the bid or buy platform uh, where you use their platform, they take care of certain aspects of the value chain, things like logistics and picking up the product, uh, delivering it to the customer, et cetera. But it just makes the whole thing easy. Mm. Um, and then once he was done with that, he was talking to me about uh, he's got a, a component of his business that focuses on customer uh, on um, or other client services because customers have to call in with you know issues with the product you know how does the product work and uh, one of the things he did was that uh, a frequently asked questions on his website uh, he had a section with frequently uh, asked questions or FAQs uh, as they call them and that quickly matured into you know wanting to have a chat function for his customers uh, which he eventually set up. Uh, but the chat function meant that he's, he was getting emails and now he needed someone to manage emails. Um, uh, but to cut the whole story short, uh, he, he quickly got to a stage where he was like, you know, when you deal with some of the bigger corporates, if you've ever been to some of the bigger websites, maybe DSTV's website, I was there a couple of years ago trying to fix an error, or you've dealt with a Discovery Health, for example, when you access the website, a chatbot comes up and says, hey, my name is so-and-so, can I help you today? So he really got into the whole thing of, you know, how do I use the chat bot function to manage mundane tasks like people calling to find out, you know, how long it's going to take to deliver an order. You know, he's currently in that journey where he's trying to leverage, you know, chat bots to address um, that aspect of his business. But the bottom line is that, you know, he's been able to create uh, new routes to market He's been able to create new revenue streams. He's been able to drive better efficiency, but more importantly, he's been able to refocus his valuable human resources towards revenue generating activities as opposed to keeping the lights on. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And I, and I love, um, there was something that came through in, 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 the, in that answer and um, I'm not sure whether you see it, whether I may be putting two and two together in the wrong way, but I've noticed that yeah. in order for that resilience or that solution to come about, there had to be more, <clears throat> excuse me, more usage of the ecosystem, a, a greater dependence yeah. on the community. So instead of me just relying mm. on myself and showing up in person, I now have to split the responsibility of the workload across a broader value chain to bring to bear my services to market. So it's an interesting thing that at a time like this, at a time like COVID, we were forced to depend on service providers and on others in a way that perhaps we didn't need to in the past. Is that, is, is that a valid observation, do you think, Dumi? Absolutely. I think uh, uh, often when I talk to members of my team and maybe friends and family as well, I always say to people that, you know, whatever you want in life, someone has got it or someone has got the answer or someone knows how to do it. Uh, the reality of life is no one is going to come to you and say, KG, I know you're struggling with this. This is how you can address it. You need to put yourself out there. You need to network effectively to make sure that, you know, you leverage in that ecosystem mm. that you're talking about. And sometimes the ecosystem is your own competition. Mm. I mean, there's a plethora of examples where competitors have started working together. I mean, the most exciting one for me or the most interesting one is the, you know, the multi-choice uh, versus Netflix uh, um, a challenge, yeah. you may call it. You know, yeah. uh, it was a challenge because they were competing, but they're not competing anymore. They they are naturally they could naturally be competitors, but these areas of synergy where they can work together. So you you need to look at the ecosystem, not just people that you network with, but also understanding the value that can come out of interactions and partnerships with your competitors, so-called competitors. Because I think the business world has progressed to 
uh, an extent where your traditional competitors are no longer competitors in the traditional sense of the word. Mm. Mm. There are always synergies. And I think it's how you, you connect the dots as yeah. you use the, uh, uh, the expression earlier. Mm. No, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that uh, for me, I'm not hearing this point spoken enough at this stage. I'm seeing it, but for some reason, it's remaining unspoken to some degree. It's like there's such a dependence now on the community. And if leaders are not recognizing this natural movement that we are all experiencing towards greater dependence across the value chain, I think we're missing the boat here. We, we have to. I mean, there's no way any of us were, were ready for for what occurred inside the year. We had to get ready for remote work in two days. So suddenly you had to depend more on your internet service provider. You had to depend more on the IT um, company that you brought in to service your people with more hardware, maybe dongles, et cetera. And then in terms of delivery of service, you had to depend on, on, on e-commerce providers that you perhaps never thought of before. You just had to start mm -hmm. depending more and more and more on the fellow um, uh, member of the tribe. And I love that it's forcing us now, this whole COVID situation, it's forcing us to be more community and it's forcing us to act more as a team. And, and quite frankly, I, I'm hoping that businesses out there, that you start seeing the importance of being great at what you do, but also being great at depending on, on the other person in your community who's good at what he or she does. And, and depend on that person and put pressure on that person to bring good services to bear for your success. And that's how we, we interweave and we, and, we, and we move forward as, as a tribe and as a community, not just as an individual. I think that's a beautiful message that just honestly came through. Wasn't expecting that one to come through, so that's great. Um, so let's, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit more about the SME community now. We're talking about this ecosystem. We're talking about each of us being strong in our respective areas and working together as a tribe. Um, you know, what are your, some of your observations on this SME segment and, and where are we headed? I think maybe just to link back to the point you made earlier on around, you know, finding synergies and collaborating and working together. Uh, something that's very interesting for me in the context of uh, SMEs is that if you think about what COVID is, other than the pains that COVID has caused, but some of the uh, uh, nuggets of gold that have come out of this situation is your ability to work remotely means that you can broaden your market, right? Uh, where traditionally your market was maybe in Johannesburg because you're based in Johannesburg, now, now suddenly your market is Africa or the world, mm. right? If you think about how you access different services from different suppliers, uh, your catchment area was probably Johannesburg, maybe Gauteng, maybe South Africa at most. Now your catchment area is global mm. uh, because nothing stops you from taking, you know, the maybe the accounting function within your business that you're not proficient in because that's not your core business, outsourcing that function to a, 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 a company that's sitting in India or a company that's sitting in Bratislava, right? I mean, we both know uh, Bratislava and India are key hubs uh, in that line of business. And because they are, there's a lot of them there and uh, it's a competitive space. That means you can get these services at uh, pretty competitive prices. Mm. Now, what started off as a painful transition of working from home has quickly progressed into, you know, uh, areas of, of opportunity for driving better efficiency, but also areas of, of opportunity for identifying new revenue streams. So I think locally, in the local cons, uh, uh, context, you know, I absolutely think, you know, SMEs, uh, there's a massive opportunity for, for SMEs. Like I said, you know, the challenge is around doing it in the most efficient manner. And I guess looking beyond uh, the problems and the challenges and seeing the opportunity. Uh, right. And in I do write quite a bit uh, around the topic of SMEs and technology. And I've written a number of pieces that focus on, you know, how do you take technology and leverage the benefits of technology to drive, you know, better revenues, mm. better uh, outcomes, better customer experience, etc. One of the most interesting ones that I just want to give as an, as, as an example, yeah. you know, I wrote a piece on augmented analytics, uh, which is going to be coming out in the next week or two. Uh, and augmented analytics is a very loaded concept that is quite complex to understand, right? Uh, but what's interesting is that, you know, augmented analytics is pervasive in our lives today. We just don't know it. You know, when you think about ordering something to eat, you go and access Uber Eats, 
and Uber Eats makes a decision in a split second on what you're going to eat, and you trust Uber Eats so much that you order exactly what Uber Eats has told you to order. Uh, or once you're done with your dinner and you want to watch a movie, you go to Netflix or DSTV now or whatever it is, Netflix tells you what to go and watch, mm. and nine out of ten times you watch what Netflix is telling you to watch. Mm. Uh, these are decisions that we make in everyday lives that Netflix and Uber Eats makes in a split second, and we're very trusting of technology. Mm. You know, another example is 10 years ago, if someone told you you're going to be doing everything on, on online banking, I didn't trust online banking, but I've, I've never been to a bank probably in four or five years because I do everything online, mm. right? Uh, so there is this notion of convenience that is driven by technology that uh, users and customers and society have become so accustomed to. It's only a matter of time before they start de demanding that level of convenience in their professional lives. Uh, so in that context, I think SMEs need to be careful not to get left behind in this traditional sense of doing business uh, and, and really keep up with the times in terms of how do we leverage technology to drive the level of convenience, to drive the level of innovation and efficiency that our customers are looking for. I just want to sneak in one more comment there and say that, you know, I often talk about, you know, the likes of Google and uh, Facebook and uh, uh, Netflix and all of these tech companies you can think of, Airbnb. And what's interesting is that, you know, traditional companies, the, the intrinsic value of traditional companies was tied up on assets that the company had. If you think of a traditional, if you think of BMW or Toyota, and you think about where the intrinsic value sits, it was in the assets. Of course, not completely, but the assets were important, right? And you look at the top 10 of the biggest companies 20, 30 years ago, it was dominated by consumer products. It was uh, dominated by car manufacturers. You fast track to today, it's dominated by tech companies mm. that don't own any assets, right? Facebook doesn't own anything. They own a couple of data, well, they, they, they own a whole lot of data centers, but what they really own is your information that you voluntarily put on Facebook, mm. that they analyze and sell back to you as inside, mm. right? Mm. Uh, you know, if you think about what Airbnb sells, they really don't own anything. They don't own any property, but they are the biggest hotel chain in the world. So mm. that way of thinking and that ability to leverage technology is what I think SMEs need to get accustomed to. Mm -hmm. Very, very insightful. Um, I mean, just your point about... Um, augmented analytics. It's not even something that I've been actively thinking about, but as you're speaking, I'm thinking, wow, that makes complete sense. These things are not just making recommendations. They're actually making decisions because nine out of 10 times, like you said, people are going to go with what um, is being suggested to them. And it also, you know, it shows just how suggestible we are as people, how suggestible we've become. And, and, and quite frankly, this is why there's so much commonality in decisions because we are being told what to do. Um, so very good insights. Uh, folks on the show today, um, I really hope that you are enjoying this as much as I am. I'm learning a ton. Uh, Dumi is providing a great amount of insight here. I hope you um, really taking in as much as you can. Uh, become part of the conversation. Go ahead and put forward some of your comments and questions. I'll uh, take them up with uh, Dumi. You can do it across all platforms. And then, of course, make sure that you complete our survey as well. I mean, we really do love, uh, love it when you give us feedback. We always listen to your feedback. We take action from your feedback. So please go ahead and complete a, feed, uh, a feedback form. It's going to take you about 30 seconds. It's mainly drop downs. Um, uh, Taryn will put it into the box, the chat box. So you can go ahead and do that as soon as you can. We're definitely not done with the show. We're still going to get some more. Uh, we're going to extract more pearls of wisdom from uh, to me so please keep enjoying with us but of course between now and the end of the show you can go ahead and start completing those forms great so um jimmy you gave us a lot of good insight across uh, the local situation how businesses can re-engineer themselves now to stop you know that uh, mental uh, geographic um cap or constraint uh, you know we can think beyond that because quite frankly we now you know We've, we've been forced into a mindset of remote work anyway. So, so we're expanding our, our thinking and our, our actions. And then you also gave commentary on, on a bit of a global perspective. So do you think that South Africa or Africa is in line with the global trends? Do you think we're deviating from the global trends in any way? What are your thoughts on that? I think maybe we, um, I think there's some very interesting innovations coming out of Africa. I think where there's a gap is really how we leverage technology to drive that. 
Um, you know, um, if you think of what happens in the US with, uh, uh, with Silicon Valley or what happens in India from an innovation or from a tech uh, perspective or other innovative uh, countries like Japan, China, et cetera, is I think there's uh, a lot of emphasis on, you know, on, on tech hubs uh, or innovation hubs. You know, I think between South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, you know, maybe Rwanda, there's uh, a fair amount of tech hubs, but I think we still need more uh, because those are really the catalysts and the drivers of, you know, marrying the concept of business and innovation. Uh, I think those would uh, absolutely play a critical role in, um, in ensuring that we continue to try and keep up and hopefully, you know, surpass um, um, uh, surpass the rest of the world in terms of what we see as innovation and what uh, the role of technology is in driving innovation. So I think we've got a bit of work to do around technology, but I think in terms of how innovative we are, I mean, I was reading an article the other day about um, uh, a gentleman from Ghana that developed, uh, you know, a, a respirator uh, for a couple of dollars. Uh, I mean, we know the debate around respirators when COVID started and uh, there were all sorts of numbers between 1,300 and I think $1,500 to buy one of these things. And this guy developed one that you can print on a 3D printer, yeah. you know, for a couple of dollars. Uh, I mean, that's the type of innovation that we're talking about in Africa. But I think more importantly, KG, Africa has got the best opportunity to be innovative because we've got fundamental problems to fix. Mm. And problems are always a catalyst of innovation. Mm, mm, mm. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, constraint is the birthplace of, uh, of innovation. And I think that South Africa, from some of the examples you gave earlier, a classic example of how South Africa responded to constraint with just fantastic innovation that the world uses to this day. So that's beautiful insight there. And then on that topic, uh, remote work, we, we're seeing some interesting trends. People are also talking about the end of lockdown and the end of the scourge of 2020 and you know, pretty much planning on getting back to normal to some degree in 2021. What are your thoughts on where remote work is actually headed? Yeah, I think the biggest, uh, the, the biggest uh, realization for me was the fact that we, we have been always ready for remote working. Uh, you know, the, the technology was there. Arguably, we, some people, some companies that didn't invest it sufficiently in that, but the, the technology has always been there. There's been enhancements of the technology, but by and large, it's always been there. What I think was a challenge was the trust element. Uh, I don't think we trusted our people uh, to do what needs to be done uh, autonomously and remotely and independently. So I think, you know, COVID has forced us to trust each other. Uh, and I think it's absolutely going to continue. Um, I've got no plans of getting back to work. Uh, you know, today is my first day back in the office since March. Wow. Um, so, so I absolutely have no intentions of going back. I don't expect my team to come back to the office because, you know, I quite appreciate, you know, uh, balancing productivity and balancing a healthy lifestyle. You know, and, uh, you know, I've got young kids and I know that it's not practical to expect someone to work from eight until five because I need to take my kids to school. They've got swimming lessons. They've got all sorts of things that they have to do. But uh, I also appreciate as a professional that I need to start my day at 5 a.m. so that by 9 a.m. I've got time for the kids, you know, and maybe around 3 p.m. I've got time for them. And in the evening, I'm going to put in another two hours. Hmm. Uh, so I think trust was a key element or a key inhibitor of us progressing, but it's here to stay. We need to embrace it and figure out how to make it uh, work even better than it's working now. Hmm. It's interesting. We might see an entire reinvention of the workday. Huh? Uh, it's likely that uh, the only reason why we bothered with an eight to five in the first place is because we, would, we, we needed to show up at a workplace. Um, and yeah. um, the whole birthplace of the eight to five was the fact that that construct was uh, made sense because we had to be in a specific space but if we can work yeah. anywhere it, it really doesn't matter really in truth when we start and when we take our first break and when we take our second break and whether we go a little bit into the evening because for most information workers people who use information as their core 
uh, job function. Um, the reality is that they, there's always going to be that portion of their job that they can do by themselves, where they just put their head down and yeah. get work done. So whether that's being done yeah. later in the, in the evening when they have their um, most creative time or when they're feeling free to just focus on their work, whenever that happens in the day, that's going to be acceptable as long as the outputs are there. But I think this, that this all hinges on that core word that you used, which is uh, trust. And uh, ultimately, on that bedrock of trust, I think all of these wonderful things are going to be possible. And and you know, um, and I think may, yeah, you go. maybe l- l- let me just bring that close to uh, small businesses, which is what our concept uh, is today. Yeah. Um, in the context of small businesses, what does remote working mean for you? Exactly as you said, you know, people can do what they need to do from anywhere in the world. Uh, What becomes important are the systems that we put in place to enable remote working efficiently. Uh, For example, you know, your salesperson uh, might sit in the East Rand and your your operations person that, you know, is the link between manufacturing and sales is sitting in Pretoria. Um, If they're using email, or so if the salesperson has to email your operations person and ask them about availability of a certain raw material to build a certain product, that's where you're going to lose money and efficiency. You need to have a system that allows for these two people to have access to the same information at the right time, right? Making it possible for the salesperson to at the click of a button, decide what is going to sell at what price and what the margins look like and what the impact to the bottom line looks like at a cell level, mm. one cell level, as opposed to waiting until the end of the month and having someone sit through you know, a spreadsheet with a, uh, a, a million line items to go and figure out if you're profitable or not. That's the change in tech and change in approach that I think is very fundamental to driving sustainable small businesses going forward. Mm-hmm. I like that. Very, very comprehensive. So I, I do want to, you know, um, emphasize the fact that there is that soft element, which is the element of trust. That's the pure people element. That's what underlies the entire equation. And above that, there are still the mechanical demands, the, the, the means, the mechanisms, the vehicle to make remote work possible, which would be the system elements, the technology elements, so that it makes it possible for us to truly get our job done as a team despite remote work. So there's those multiple layers of this whole remote work picture, which is not just one thing in isolation. We can't just have uh, technology in the absence of the underlying trust. And we can't just have trust, but not equip the people with what they need to do their job. So very, very, very important points, very comprehensive there, Jimmy. Um, so, you know, um, Jimmy, I'm just gonna, um, go ahead to this next, um, hairy question here while we still have some time with you. And again, note to everyone, we've got eight minutes left in the show. So feel free to drop in your questions and your comments so we can get these through to do me. Um, so Dumi, you mentioned the need for, for um, you know, rethinking our systems and equipping our people with the right things for the here and now to bring out the best in our people. Now, what do you say to those leaders who are hesitant to spend on those systems as we go through a period of transition? Yeah, I think that's a very, you know, very difficult question. But my view on it is that, you know, um, spending is about prioritizing correctly. Mm. Um, and I think when you prioritize, you've got to think about the, the business problem that you're trying to address. Um, if someone say to me that, you know, they've got a serious problem with managing their operations in their business, you know, sales doesn't know what manufacturing is doing, what finance is doing, what HR is doing, et cetera. And uh, they were hesitating if they should address that problem. I would ask them, you know, how fundamental or how important is addressing that problem to your business? Does it threaten the existence of your business in the future? If it does, it's a no-brainer. You've got to spend money to address that problem because you will not exist in the future if you don't address that problem. So I think prioritizing should be based on, you know, the business problem, the business need, and the impact of that problem to the business. Uh, So what I'm saying, Kirushin, is that you know, technology only enables strategy, right? Strategy needs to be based on the right elements, on the right, you know, stakeholders or players in the business. You know, every business, regardless of what you sell or what services you 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 render, you gotta think about a customer, you gotta think about a supplier, you gotta think about an employee, you gotta think about the operations, and you gotta think about the sentiments around what your business does. Uh, 
uh, does, because sentiment is a key part of competitive advantage today. If uh, a thousand people in Facebook or Hello Peter, whatever, are saying your services are crap, no one is going to want to do business with you. So <laughs> understand the priorities, understand which ones are pressing, and make sure that you are addressing the ones that are pressing. You've got a plan in how you can address them. You've got phases in how you can ro uh, roll out that plan. But right now, if you've got issues and lessons that have come out of COVID, right now is a good time to spend. Of course, it's not always easy because small businesses don't have infinite resources. You need to decide if you buy a delivery van or if you buy an ERP system. I appreciate the complexity of that, system, uh, of that uh, conundrum. But uh, you know, if an ERP system is going to generate new revenue streams and save you money, then it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day, what you're saying is that these decisions in order to prioritize correctly have to be based on insight. And in the past, we might've gotten away with not always having insight because we had you know, surpluses and there was like probably more play in the margins. But now in these tougher times, we need good insight. So the decision between a delivery van or an ERP, like you mentioned, has to be based on some kind of business metrics and data that we have to be able to examine. And that in itself calls mm -hmm. for uh, the existence of a system. So I'm thinking an ERP for sure, you know, because obviously you need that, you need that insight. Now on that note, um, I want you to touch on this before we wrap. A quick comment here from Vimla. Vimla says, um, thank you for these insights. So definitely appreciate it there. Um, so before we start to wrap here, Dumi, let's confront this big uh, question. What do you say to the, to the many people who are saying that SAP is not for small or medium sized businesses? Yeah. I think, I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, maybe the, the easiest way of explaining it is that if you look at our, 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 our business globally, 80% uh, of our business is with the mid-market and SMEs are part of the mid-market. Um, I think it's important to, you know, draw a distinction between, you know, the business that SAP was 10 years ago and the business that we are today. Mm. You know, ten, uh, uh, 10 years ago, the technology was predominantly driven by uh, an on-prem approach, meaning you had a data center somewhere in your basement. You had to buy the equipment, you had to pay electricity for it, you had to insure it, and you had to pay people to work on that infrastructure before you can load a piece of software on it. You know, times have moved on. You know, we're talking about the cloud now, and the cloud is not a new concept. You know, the day you started using Facebook was the day you started using cloud, mm. right? It's been around for a long time. Uh, but now what we're saying is that how do we leverage the benefits of the cloud in a professional sense, in a business sense? Uh, so the cloud has taken away a lot of these capex or upfront costs and investments because cloud is a consumption-based model. Same way you manage your cell phone data is the way you manage any services on the cloud. Uh, so it's important to say that, you know, the cloud uh, addresses the cost element, it addresses the time to value element, you know, traditional on-prem solutions take a long time to implement, uh, to implement. So your deployment is longer and your time to value is longer, but with cloud, you know, your time to value is days or weeks, uh, as opposed to months, hmm. uh, uh, right? So the cloud addresses those sort of challenges. The last important point to to, to, to add the KG is the fact that, you know, the cloud makes it possible for a business of any size to play in the space. Because if you had to invest on, a, on, on infrastructure to have access to a solution, you know, the scale, the, the, the break-even point required you to have a certain number of employees. Otherwise, it didn't make sense. Mm. Now we've got customers that are running our solutions and they've got 10 employees. Um, so there is no, uh, I've had customers saying, I'm, I'm not big enough to leverage our technology. That statement is no longer true. Mm. So SAP's business has evolved. Uh, um, it's not just SAP, all our competitors, all of us that play in this space have evolved significantly. And today there is no solution that we cannot offer through a cloud-based uh, model, mm. uh, which is obviously uh, uh, quite efficient and quite cost-effective as well. Yeah, and for sure, I mean, it's taken this big capital, like you described beautifully, it's taken this massive capital expenditure. It's made it a lot more, pay as you grow. And I think that um, that concept of 
pay as you grow is, is a fundamental to why SAP today is so much more accessible to the smaller business community. And quite frankly, let's be honest, you out the box, what you're getting at that incremental cost is pretty much the same as what a big, big, big enterprise would get after they invest heavily uh, from a capital point of view, a small business is able to get that on a small incremental per user basis. So to me, it's like a great day today to be thinking SAP as a small business. And, and, and quite frankly, it was almost impossible to do that in the past. I got, um, um, you know, I've got um, an, a nice personal question here for you from uh, Sashin. I want to make sure we get to it before we wrap. Um, uh, Les Holmes says, uh, great insight and viewpoints. Thanks. So that's some good feedback there. And then Sashin is asking this question. Let's see if we can get through it before we wrap for the, for the day. Uh, Dumi, what is your daily routine that makes you successful and keeps up your motivation? Yeah, I've got a couple of moments. I can uh, spare a couple of moments if someone wants to ask additional questions after um, after eleven. Uh, but basically, you know, routine is a very routine is habit, uh, and I think routine is probably the most difficult thing that all of us have to deal with. Um, so for me, typically, I I uh, I'm up very early. Uh, I'm not much of a sleeper. Uh, so my day typically starts at 5 a.m. And between 5 and 7, I'm taking care of admin, you know, email, because we only have to deal with email. Uh, I, I get a couple of hundred emails every day. Uh, and then obviously part of that is prioritizing correctly and making sure and making sure that um, and making sure that, you know, I understand what needs to be done at what time. Um, and then obviously going through the day, it's very important to leverage your support system around you. We all have very good people around us, whether it's family or whether it's team members, whether it's people of the extended team, you know, leverage people around you because uh, people are naturally willing to help. You just need to ask for help. Uh, so my routine revolves around that. Um, I'm a very structured person, uh, but also, you know, I'm not afraid to ask for help. Uh, if I don't know something, I don't know it. You know, you, you can't know everything. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. I love that. I mean, I, I got it on your routine and it was great to get that insight, but I think the gold nugget there in terms of, I, I really hope everyone's gotten that. And that is that's this power of help. And, and what you said there so beautifully, people are naturally inclined to want to help. People are wanting to help more than we realize. And, and it's, it's really that mindset or that theme of what came up earlier in the discussion as well, to be able to be willing to depend on the support structure that we have around us to leverage that. And it's funny, we actually wind up making the people around us feel valuable the more we call on for that, for that team help, you know, or that, um, that, that, that sense of uh, partnership as we do things. Um, Anonymous put forward a comment here saying, it is fantastic that remote work has now been seen as something that is actually viable and becoming a necessity, but all partners and suppliers are not yet on board with this as we still sit with brick and mortar limitations for doing business in certain regions and countries. Do you want to give a quick comment there um, to me before we wrap? Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a real challenge. I mean, if I speak from an SAP point of view, um, just to link on to the question you asked about SAP being for big enterprises, not for small companies, one of the key areas of investment for us is, you know, really developing our go-to-market through channel partners, because channel partners play a very important role in taking our value proposition to the market. And part of that is making sure that our channel partners have access to us and we've got access to them, and that uh, between the three of us ourselves, the channel partner and the customer, we are then enabled uh, to offer the best advice and to position the best possible solution to address the problem. Key to that conversation, uh, uh, KG, is enabling technology. So we, we are investing ourselves in making sure that you know, partners don't need to think about basic things, that there's a piece of tech but that's taking care of those decisions so that they can focus on the customer. So it's a valid... Uh, uh, comment and it's one that requires us to continuously engage in and to continuously invest uh, mm -hmm. in that area. Absolutely. Great, great, great feedback there, Dumi. And I think that uh, in general, uh, all, all of the, the, the points that you raised, very, very, very important. Um, some of it a little bit more at the basic uh, philosophical level, and it really gets us to think in a certain way. So I personally have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. I think it's been a fantastic discussion with Dumi today. What an epic, epic um, grand finale episode for uh, Unite for Small. I want to reiterate, as I've done before through the series, that you always have access to the experts um, that we've hosted on our show. So feel free to complete a survey, request some uh, 
follow-up activities, some follow-up um, engagement, if that's what you're looking for, go ahead, request that in our survey form. We will always respond to each and every request positively. We try our best to arrange meetings, to arrange further engagements, to ensure that you get value and that you get help after the show. So go ahead and, uh, and complete a form and request as much as you'd like. We, we're relevant and we're appropriate. We will go ahead and set up the meeting with perhaps Doomy or otherwise. All right, folks. So on that note, I want to um, say a very heartfelt thanks to Doomy for making himself available today. He's given us a lot of time. We've gone a little bit over time because we just can't get enough of this. Uh, so thank you, uh, Doomy. Thank you so much for being part of the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And, uh... Good day to everyone. <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining the show. Um, and stay tuned for more uh, early next year. We will miss you over the coming weeks. We want to wish you a very safe and healthy festive season. It's been quite a year. Make sure you go ahead and uh, you know treat yourself. Enjoy December. Really give yourself the break that you deserve. Because like I said, it has been a year like no other. And if, if, if there's any group of people that deserve a, a good time it's, um, at this time of year, it's going to be all of us who worked super hard to keep the show on the road so have a great one uh, we wish you the best from the entire team here at table manners uh, for robots together with all of our wonderful clients and guests who've made the show possible on behalf of all of us we wish you the best festive season ever and we're looking forward to seeing you in 2021 thank you and that's it <laughs>